Hello everybody, in this video I'm going to be showing you the difference between various types of marking gauges and how to use them. So let's get going. So before we go any further, little disclaimer that everything I'm saying here is in the context of fine woodworking. So if you are a general DIYer, some of the stuff in here might be useful to you, but it may also be a little bit finicky and just a bit over the top. So let's have a look at what we got on the table. So the basic function of a marking gauge is to mark a parallel offset line from one edge of something. So you set a distance on the marking gauge and you scratch it along the edge of a workpiece and it creates a parallel line for you. You can go across the grain, you can go with the grain. If it was a diagonal thing, you could go diagonally if you wanted but that's the primary function of a marking gauge. And this is an essential thing to be able to carry out in so many areas of woodworking. Think dovetails. Some people use a marking gauge to scratch the baseline of the dovetails and then that creates a knife line that you can put the chisel into and make sure each part of the dovetail is cut to the correct depth. You could also use a marking gauge to work out how thick you want something to be. I did a chopping board series last year where I showed you how to flatten, square, thickness and join three bits of wood together to create a chopping board and I used a marking gauge to set the thickness of the finished individual pieces. And I mean you can just use it for general layout as well. For example let's find the center of this bit of wood. Yes I could just draw a crosshair on it but for the sake of this demonstration we'll do it the difficult way. If you want to find the center of this you can set a marking gauge to roughly center, lock it down, scratch in from one side, scratch in from the other and then the distance between those two lines is where the center line is going to be. So I could also do it from here. Bang, sorted. But the key thing to a marking gauge is consistency and repeatability as well. I've just showed you an example of marking out on one piece of wood. Yes, it's a little bit slower than drawing the crosshairs, but if you've got a whole bunch of them to do, then you set the marking gauge to one of them, scratch, scratch, crosshairs on the end of that, crosshairs, on the end of that and then you just go through the batch without even have to think about what you're doing. I could just look out the window, I could talk to my mate while I'm doing this. The marking gauge does all the work for you without having to draw things on using a ruler and all that. And by the way that's just one of the uses. There's loads of instances where you can use offset lines to lay out lines on jigs, furniture, just all sorts of things. But anyway, before we get into how to actually use the marking gauge, let's just talk about the ones we've got on the table here. We have got a standard traditional wooden marking gauge here. It's got a pin in one edge of it and a stock that you can slide forwards and backwards and lock at the desired offset. This one also has two pins on the reverse side which you can use for mortises, tenons, things where you need two offset lines from one edge. So you can unlock the stock, you can slide this little tab sideways and then adjust the stock to wherever you want it, lock it down and then everything's in place. Not all of these traditional marking gauges have that included but it is always useful to have. The only downside to this being, probably due to my clumsiness, is when you're picking this up it's quite easy to forget you've got two pins on the back. You can zero the stock up like that so then this pin you can't really stab yourself on it but then the one on the back is still poking out and yeah I've caught myself a few times on them but yeah that is your traditional marking gauge. Then we move across to a more modern marking gauge. This one's made by Veritas and is my go-to marking gauge for pretty much everything. Unlike the pin marking gauge here, this one has a rounded top on it which does all the cutting, which you'll see later on is a little bit more useful. And this one also has little features like micro adjust on it as well so you can make small adjustments to the offset of this by using a little screw thread that's built into it. It's quite handy to have, it's not essential but yeah that is another type of marking gauge. Oh and the cutting point recesses into the head so you can stand it like that and you can't cut yourself on it which is useful. The one we have here is a mortise gauge. So on this traditional marking gauge we had the two pins on the back. This one has two rods in it, you unlock both sides and then you've got two rods that can be individually offset from one another and the stock itself. This is pretty much the same design as something like this, just with two rods in it. And you can also use this as a single marking gauge by simply using one of the rods instead of using both of them. So if anything, it's a little bit more versatile, but it's a bit more cumbersome. And then finally, this one is, it looks very similar to this, but this one has a knife in it as opposed to a pin. 
So this is what's called a cutting gauge and is primarily used for cutting across the grain. And I'll be showing you the difference of using this versus this for cutting with and across the grain a little bit later on in the video. But let's stop talking about the theory of using a marking gauge and I'll actually show you how to use one. So when using a marking gauge, it's always a bit easier to put the wood you want to mark on an elevated surface and then you can focus 100% on just getting that line nice and consistent. I personally hold it in my hands sometimes while I'm marking out joints and I've had a lot of practice doing this but it's not something I would advise doing especially if you're starting because these things are sharp and it's very easy to slip and it's not nice to be cut from one of these especially if you've got that pin, let alone two of them poking out of this one. So if you're starting off, pop it on an elevated surface and it will make it a lot easier for you. And one of the things you might hear is, should I push, well, I did that the wrong way. <laughs> should I push or pull the marking gauge towards me while I'm marking out? I am telling you now, it does not matter. Some people will tell you to push it away from you so you can see what you're doing. But like, are these people looking at it from here or I don't know, just try both of them. If one way works, do that. If the other way works, do that. I personally like to pull the gauge towards me. I just find I get a little bit more control from that. And generally, my students find it a little bit easier as well, probably for the same reason that it's easier to use a Japanese saw. Cutting on the pull stroke just tends to be a little bit more of a natural motion for a lot of people as opposed to pushing because it induces a bit of wobble, but then pulling it towards you can as well. So. Yeah, it doesn't matter is what I'm saying, whatever works. But quite possibly the most common mistake that I see a lot of beginners do when using a marking gauge for the first time is getting that line straight. And there is various reasons for that. The main ones being using too much pressure and not using the correct angle of attack, especially with these old traditional style marking gauges. A lot of people see the final destination as being, right, I need to create a line there. So what I'll do, get the marking gauge on it, dig it in, and then do that and just try and create that line as deep as possible. And then it ends up being ragged, it's not straight and it's an absolute nightmare to try and clean off afterwards. So instead what you need to do is a series of light successive passes with the marking gauge to create that line gradually rather than all at once. Now, as you can probably see here, the marking gauge is vibrating. Yes, the line is nice and crisp, but it gives you a bigger chance of jumping out that line, getting a bit of wobble on it and throwing your layout off. So instead, what we need to do is make use of the fact that this marking gauge has these lovely rounded edges. And what we're gonna do is put it on like that and then roll it over one of those edges until the knife engages in the wood. That then becomes a datum surface that you can rest the marking gauge on and it becomes so much easier to use. So we're using light pressure, we're referencing it off the marking gauge itself, and that line is looking really good now. So going through these samples, that is the result of too much pressure and going in perpendicular to the wood. That is the result of reducing the pressure but still going in perpendicular. And this is what happens where you angle the marking gauge to go in at a shallower angle of attack and also reduce the pressure. It's quite a stark difference. You can see which one's gonna be easier to work to later on. And by the way, if you prefer to push the marking gauge away from you, then obviously you just tilt it away from you and push it like that. Don't tilt it towards you and then try and push forward because that's just gonna be like a spear. Tilt it away and again, lots of successive passes. And so now we know how to use a marking gauge correctly I'm gonna show you the difference between a marking gauge fitted with a pin and a cutting gauge fitted with a knife. So I'll show you cutting across the grain to begin with. With a cutting gauge, we'll tilt it back, light pressure, and we'll do lots of passes, as I just showed you, to create that line. Now let's do exactly the same with a pin marking gauge. I'll set it so it's offset from the same edge. Tilt back, light pressure, drag back. So starting with the line on the left, this was done with the cutting gauge with the knife fitted, and then this one on your right was done with the marking gauge fitted with the pin. Now you can see there's not a huge difference between them. If you apply the techniques I just showed you with reducing the pressure, reducing the angle of attack, you still get a pretty good result from something that really shouldn't be used to cut across the grain. But saying that, you can see that the cutting gauge line is it's just definitely a lot cleaner and it's gonna be easier to work to and remove later on. And the other thing to bear in mind here is the shape of the actual cutting point itself. On a cutting gauge, it's a knife. So we have got one flat surface and then a bevel going up one side and then the top of the blade. Whereas on a pin, it's a point on the end of it. And obviously in a bit of wood, they are gonna cut 
that shape into it. Now the reason why a cutting gauge is useful when cutting across the grain, especially if you're doing hand cut joints, is because if the end grain was here, let's just ignore this for now, and we have referenced the cutting gauge off that end grain and scratched it back, we've created a cut like this. And yes, of course, it is a little bit exaggerated. If it was a dovetail, this area here would be removed and you would put a chisel into that gauge line and you would pare it down. So with this area removed, what that gives you is a perfectly flat and square edge left over at the end. Whereas if this was a pin instead from a marking gauge, then it's gonna leave you with a very small area there that's gonna be bruised and will be more difficult to remove. And the other thing to bear in mind with the cutting gauge is you can usually take that blade out to sharpen it which means that if you want to remove material on the far side of the edge you're offsetting that line from, you can just simply put the knife in upside down and then it puts a bevel on the other side. I won't go into details now where that would be useful, but thicknessing is one example of that. So now let's look at marking with the grain. This is usually where a marking gauge comes into its own because it doesn't tend to track the grain as much as a cutting gauge fitted with a knife. Let me just flip that round so I've got it in upside down. Now, in all honesty, this is stuff that's written in books. This is stuff that's on all the descriptions of the shops and everywhere you read about the difference between a cutting and a marking gauge. It always states that a marking gauge should be used for cutting with the grain and a cutting gauge does track the grain. To be honest, I haven't found this to be a huge problem. Yes, a pin marking gauge doesn't do it as much, but you can still get away with doing it with a cutting gauge if it's the only thing you have. Simply apply those things I said before about tilting it back and doing lots of successive passes. The other thing you can do to reduce the chances of it tracking the grain, because it can still happen with a pin marking gauge, may I add. Both of these will try and track the grain to an extent. That is just the way wood works, especially with material like this ash, where it's a very coarse grain. Closer grain timbers like beech and maple won't tend to track it as much, but ash, oak, stuff like that is a bit of a nightmare to mark with the grain. But to make it easier, as I was saying, instead of committing to the entire line, start down the bottom, tilt it back, light pressure. When you're doing this, focus more on pushing the stock of the marking gauge into the side of the component rather than down. We'll start here, tilt back, light pressure, drag it back. And what we'll do is as we're dragging back, we'll just slowly move it up the piece of wood, increase those strokes as we go. And then what you're doing is creating a track that the pin falls into and then it's less likely to wander later on. Whereas if you start here, it's got this entire board to find a track later on. Whereas starting at the bottom, you create it early and then it stays nice and consistent along the whole thing. So let's try a cutting gauge right next to that and see if we can get it to stay nice and straight. Tilt it back, light pressure. Sorted, that's worked just fine. So now you can see that the line on the left is the marking gauge with the pin and that little line on the right is the cutting gauge fitted with the knife. They've both stayed parallel along the entire board. The only difference being that marking gauge line is a little bit easier to see right now, whereas the cutting gauge line, it blends in with the grain and is therefore quite difficult to follow later on. So a marking gauge definitely has its merits here, but in regards to cutting a parallel line, there's no dispute here that you can quite easily do it in a coarse grain timber such as ash with a cutting gauge if you need to. It's just a bit more difficult to see. And so now we've covered that, let's get into the advantages of using a more modern type of marking gauge such as this Veritas one. As I said, this has a round point on it which generally makes it a lot easier for beginners to use because unlike a marking gauge and a cutting gauge, there is no points as such on it or it's not a spike. Yes, of course it is sharp on the end or else it won't cut, but the fact that it's a circle with a cutting edge on the circumference of it means that the angle of attack is a lot shallower with this thing. For example, if we've got a bit of wood and then we've got a marking gauge with a circle point on the end of it, the angle of attack is something like that. It's incredibly shallow and as this gets deeper, the circle, it's kind of easing the marking gauge into the cut rather than it being a knife or something like that going in where the angle of attack is a lot steeper. Now this one I've just drawn here is what happens when you go in perpendicular with the knife, but you'll remember if we angle that knife point back and let's say we're dragging it this way, then the angle of attack 
is this. So you'll see it's still pretty shallow, but with a circle, it's gonna be even more shallower than that. This also tends to make it a little bit easier to mark deeper lines with this marking gauge. Across the grain, as we saw, you only need a few passes to create a line that's easily visible. Whereas if you're marking with the grain, then you need to get that line pretty deep before you can see it. And having that low angle of attack means that it's really easy to get to the required depth so you can see this line. So if that's already sold you on one of these, then there's a link in the description where you can purchase one. That is an affiliate link, so I get a little cut from that if you buy it through it, which I'd be incredibly thankful for. But before you do that, I am just gonna say, that's not to say that you can't achieve the same result with a cutting gauge by simply changing the grind of that knife on the end of it to create a rounded knife. This is something that is covered in a book by Robert Ingham, which I highly recommend. Robert is a world-class furniture maker. The work he does is just absolutely incredible and this book is filled with tips. I'm also gonna put a link to that in the description affiliate link again for the same reasons as before if you want to thank me for this video you can buy it through that uh, the page in here i'm not going to show you it up close because i don't want to get in trouble here we go so there's a little bit down here on page 71 that shows a blade before modification and a blade after modification it's not just a case of grinding that rounded edge on there there are a few changes that he does to the marking gauge to make it work even better and just little tips like that throughout the book as well as mind-blowing tips they're all in there really recommend it but yeah that is what you can do to a marking gauge to make it work similar to one of these things now the other thing you might have heard quite a lot about is should you leave the marking gauge lines behind after cutting the joints and this is something that i'm i'm not sure on myself to be honest i think it depends on what you like what the customer likes most importantly if you're doing this as a commission but it's certainly something you should work out before applying the first layer of finish with dovetails i'm going to use this as the example like i do for everything it's very easy nowadays to buy a router jig and cut dovetails with a router dovetail cutter make a load of noise and you can create a draw in what 15 minutes and it gets the job done. I am not saying there's anything wrong with that at all. If you want to do that, if you want to create dovetails using a jig and you want to take advantage of that mechanical strength without having to go through the tedious process of cutting them by hand, then do it. But if like myself, you enjoy the process and you just enjoy doing something by hand for the feeling of accomplishment at the end, then do it by hand. But anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. Leaving the marking gauge lines behind after cutting the dovetails would be a sign it would show the customer that they have been hand cut, which is something that you can normally bump the price up for because it shows that a lot more time has gone into cutting that joint. Whereas by getting rid of that marking gauge line, then there's not a lot to say that that dovetail joint could have been cut by a machine. This is why you commonly see dovetails where the pins are incredibly fine, not only because it's some people's preference, but the fact that those pins are very fine shows that it had to be cut by hand because you can't quite possibly get a route of it small enough and strong enough to cut the pin to that size. So there is various ways of showing that a joint is hand cut without having to physically tell the customer that they are hand cut. But by leaving the marking gauge lines behind, then that's a good way to prove it. What I would say, however, if you choose to leave them behind or if you choose to get rid of them, make sure you keep it consistent. Make sure you completely get rid of those lines or make sure they're looking nice and clean from that first bit of marking out you do. You don't really wanna be in that gray area between where you've got some joints that are completely clean of marking gauge lines and then you've got others where there's a few marking gauge lines left behind. The reason I got this out is because it is something that I did on this. These dovetails are all hand cut and I made the decision to get rid or try and get rid of all the marking gauge lines on here. But in a lot of places, there are still marking gauge lines that have been left over. For the most part, I, I don't know what I was thinking. They're quite obviously still left behind. Whereas there's other places where they're not too, they're not really that obvious. The thing to bear in mind with this is when you put a finish on a bit of wood, it essentially bumps up the contrast of everything, which does wonders for joints where you've got end grain showing with side grain going in. But if you've got any marking gauge lines left over, then it makes them more prominent as well. Even if it's something that's incredibly fine that you can't see before putting the finish on, it will probably show up later. This dovetail, for example, you can see I made the effort to remove the marking gauge line, but I didn't quite go deep enough. So we've got these little lines here and here that have been left over, which are so fine, you can't 
you can't feel them at all. It would have been very difficult to see them before putting that finish on, but as soon as you do, it makes them a little bit darker. But this is a tool chest for me, so it doesn't really matter too much, but leaving the marking gauge lines behind is definitely something you should at least inquire about before doing it. But what you shouldn't do is assume that there's a right and wrong with it. If someone tells you that you shouldn't leave the gauge lines behind, but you do want to, then just leave them behind and stick to things. What I'm saying is it's completely up to you. But there we go. I do hope you found that video useful and you're now comfortable with using a marking gauge or a cutting gauge or whatever you feel like using. Just keep practicing at using one. Bear in mind that with woodworking, you can be an absolute master at using a saw, at using a chisel and doing some beautiful work. But if your laying out is absolutely rubbish, then those sawing skills and those chiseling skills are all for naught. There is no point working accurately to inaccurate lines. Accurate measuring and marking is the foundation of fine woodworking, hands down. It's an artwork and it is something that I take a lot of time in getting correct. I make sure those lines are as clean, as straight and as accurate as possible before even thinking about the next stage. It's something that you should put a lot of time into practicing and getting right. So, as I said, I hope you found that video useful. If you did, don't forget to press the like button below. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I will see you in the next video.